the James E. Alatus Award for service to TESOL. And in 2016, she was recognized as one of the association's 50 at 50. Mary is a former TESOL board member and is currently serving as co-chair of VELPATH and on the Diverse Voice Task Force. Let us welcome Mary today. Oh, thank you very much, Ayana, for that very generous introduction. Uh, before I begin, I'd just like to say how honored I am to participate in TESOL's inaugural Black History Month webinar. And I thank the TESOL leadership for giving us this space and the TESOL staff for their support, especially Juliette Mason, who has been very helpful. I wanna thank my co-presenters, Awad and Harry, and uh, I'm especially great, grateful for, to Ayana Cooper for making this possible and for her vision and her leadership. So thank you very much, Ayana. So uh, my segment of this webinar is on an oral history of an Afro-Caribbean in World War II. The Afro-Caribbean is the gentleman in this picture who was my father, Lionel Romney. Um, but a little more specifically, I'm going to be talking about oral history itself, including a definition, and Black history and the relationship between oral history and Black history, followed by a few comments on oral history and English language teaching, and concluding with my father's oral history of his World War II experience. I used that oral history to write this book about my father's experience. I'd like to offer a definition of oral history as the intersection of a person's life with historical events and the recording of that person talking about that intersection. And this is done in interviews. So as such, oral history creates a bridge between individual human experience and historical events it can arouse and increase students' interest in history, and it can inspire them to explore historical contexts further. Oral history personalizes and humanizes history by describing it from the perspective of an eyewitness and putting a human face on it. The interviewee becomes the personification of history, and in this way, oral history removes the abstract nature of traditional approaches to the study of history. Oral history democratizes history because it provides opportunities for untold perspectives and experiences to be shared. It gives access to undertold episodes in history. So it helps achieve diversity, equity, and inclusion in the study of history and in education in general. It dignifies the lives of everyday people and it helps students see that everyone has participated in or has been a witness to historical events. History is shared by everyone, not only famous people, and that everyone's story is valuable and everyone's story is interesting and, and worthy of attention. Um, oral history has an importance for African Americans and other African diaspora peoples throughout the world because Black history has largely been neglected, omitted, and, misrepresenta and misrepresented. The exclusion of Black history from the mainstream, especially from history books, is a significant element of systemic racism because it makes Black people invisible to others and to ourselves and it creates the impression that we did not have a role in certain chapters in history. Sometimes knowledge of history resides only in human memory, so oral history is the only way to access it. This is especially true in Africa, which has a very rich and well-developed oral tradition. Uh, we'll come back to this one later if we have time. Um, but for now, I want to move to um, oral history and English language teaching. So where this is concerned, I think you'll see how the four skill areas are included in an approach where you might have individual students um, or small groups of students record their own interviews with people and transcribe the interviews and then report to the class in an oral presentation where they would play excerpts of their interviews 
and they could report to you as their teacher with a written summary where they would analyze and summarize right. their interview. Before yeah. students record their interviews, you, you could, could assign, assign some background readings on the period of history in which the interviewee will be talking about. So you see how the skills are, are integrated. Um, activities centered around oral history can provide some very rich contexts for vocabulary and grammar, um, especially question formation and past tenses and many other areas. Um, I've prepared a, an extensive four page single space uh, handout for you with uh, a substantial amount of information on um, why and how to use oral history with your students. And that's available on the TESOL website. And my contact information is there as well if you have any questions or you need any guidance on that. Um, for many people outside of academia, the purpose of oral history is to gain a deeper understanding of their families, especially their, um, their family's history and the influence of history on their family, their family's role in history, um, their own personal history or their roots. And this leads you to a deeper understanding of, of your own, uh, well, I'll say a deeper self-knowledge. Um, it also gives you a way to connect older generations of your family with present and future generations of your family. Now, I embarked on my oral history project with my father um, for all of these reasons and, and other reasons, but it went in many directions that I, I thought that, it, that I never thought it would go in. And he told me stories that I, I never thought that he would reveal. Um, again, this is a picture of my father uh, immediately after the end of World War II in Europe. And while I was recording uh, his oral history, I found that what he told me about World War II and the Nazi era really brought history to life for me. And it inspired me to research and read much more than I ever would have if he had not built that bridge between his own experience, his lived experience and that period in history. I think that many students and other people um, are disinterested in history because it's often presented as a collection of abstract dates, places, names, statistics, and they feel that those have no relevance to their lives or to the present. But oral history is just the opposite of this uh, because it brings history to life. Um, this was my father's name, Lionel Romney, and this was when he lived. And this is his life in geographical terms. Um, I don't have time to explain everything, but um, I'll say that number one is meant to represent um, the island in the Caribbean where he was from. That island is St. Martin. And uh, um, all four of my grandparents were from there and all of my traceable ancestors were from there. Uh, so my roots are here on this, this little island in the Caribbean, uh, St. Martin. And number two is meant to represent Aruba, Curaçao and Venezuela where my father lived for several years. Um, I'm gonna outline his World War II experience as he told it to me uh, in his oral history. Now, as a civilian, he was a sailor on cargo ships sailing between the Caribbean, North America, and Europe uh, between the mid-1930s and 1940. In June 1940, he was on uh, the, the SS Machis, which was a Greek merchant ship sailing with a load of coal through the Mediterranean from Cardiff in Wales on its way to Greece. That ship was mined, as, as you know, a mine is an explosive device, and it sank, uh, but the crew was rescued by the Italian Navy, um, at which point my father became a political prisoner in Italy, because, of course, the, the war was, was in progress. So the, the ship was sailing in this area here between Tunisia and Sicily, so it struck the mine somewhere around here because they were first taken to this little island, which you can barely see, but the name of that island is Pantelleria. And from there they were taken to, to Sicily. And um, over the next four years, he was transferred through a series of internment camps through Italy. Um, 
until 1944, when he was deported to the Mauthausen concentration camp in Austria, where he um, was a prisoner for almost a year until the camp was liberated by the American army at the end of the war. Um, just to give you a profile of Mauthausen within the context of World War II and the Nazi era, um, as I say, it was a concentration camp, but there were many different kinds of concentration camps. There were death camps or extermination camps. There were labor camps. There were prison camps. There were women's camps. There were transfer camps. But Mauthausen was unique in the entire camp system because it was the only death through work camp. It was specifically designed to work the prisoners to death. And most of the work was done in the quarry. Uh, this is a picture of, of the, the floor of the quarry. And um, the camp was built um, on top of the largest granite quarry in Austria so that the Nazis could have a captive labor force to quarry the granite. So here you see um, prisoners carrying 110 pound blocks of granite on their backs up the stairway, which came to be known as the stairway of death. A lot of prisoners died on this stairway because they couldn't tolerate the physical stress in combination with starvation and disease and other stressors. Um, about 200,000 prisoners passed through this camp during the life of, of the camp. And at least 90,000 were worked to death, tortured to death, starved to death, um, or died in, in, in other ways. But Mauthausen was more than a camp. It was a system of 49 subcamps, the main camp, which is here, and um, 49 subcamps. So again, just for some context, Mauthausen is here uh, on the Danube. This river is the Danube. And um, you might be able to see the town of Linz, um, which is marked here. This was uh, Hitler's birthplace. And here is Auschwitz, which was the biggest and most notorious of all the, the concentration camps. And um, some of the other notorious ones are, are marked here in, in uh, Europe. But as you can see, they extended, the camp system extended from the Netherlands and France in the West, all the way over to Belarus and Ukraine in the East, um, Latvia in the North, and um, I think other countries. And these are only a few of the major camps on this, on this uh, map. But um, my father witnessed the destruction of human life every day that he was in Mauthausen, which, as I say, was almost a year. He was wondering, uh, he was always wondering uh, if he would be next. Um, so he was deeply traumatized by his experience there, so much so that he was virtually silent about it for over 40 years. Uh, but finally, at the end of 1989, he opened up and began to talk about it. I never thought that he would because it had taken me over 20 years to, to get him to, to talk about it. So I want to play a few minutes of his very first conversation about his experience in Mauthausen. Um, and this was from our very, very first oral history interview together. It's less than three minutes. Um, we've been having a little bit of difficulty with the sound, but apparently if you give it a few seconds, it, it becomes more audible. So let, let's try it. Hello? Hello? No, we're not hearing it, Mary. Good evening. Can't hear it at all? Yeah, I'm facing some. Sorry? No, we can't hear it at all right now. Can okay. I thought I heard some of it. Oh, you thought you heard some of it? I think so, but it might have. It might have been background. It's just starting to play, I thought. Mary, it's Melissa. Mary. You, you're going to have to unshare. And then when you reshare, there's a button on the bottom where it clicks and it yes. says to do audio. So just unshare and then reshare. Look for that button that says uh, share audio when you reshare the second time. Let's see. 
and then um, share audio. Let me see. It's up the bottom left, Mary. Bottom left. Bottom, bottom left. Share audio. Share sound and optimize for video clip. It's on the bottom left side when you click share. Yeah. Did you click share? Yet, Mary? Share screen. I click share screen. Okay, so on the bottom, it should say something about sound or audio, something like that. Uh, it says um, one participant can share at a time and multiple participants can share simultaneously. That's what it says. Uh, no, that's the share screen button. Um, it, you need to reshare again, and that initial pop up window will have the option at the bottom left <clears throat> to share sound. Okay. Let me see. I don't see that. Yeah. So, Mary, I, I see it now. If you unshare your screen really quickly. Yeah. Now, when you hit share screen, and you know that other window comes up with showing your various screens, and you yes. click on you. Down at the bottom, there's a check off for share sound. Okay, I see it finally. Okay. <laughs> cool. Yay! I didn't even know that. So thank you all that helped us. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. I'm trying to share the screen. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Okay, let's try this again. By train. A cattle car, a cattle, uh, what the hell you call that? Uh, a cattle car? Yeah, a cattle car. Yeah. A river, what is bundling up there. And where in Austria? Well, it's up in the place, it's near to Graz. But in the, the, the confrontation camp, one of those notorious confrontation camps, where Mauthausen is up on the hill. They had the crematorium and the what the, the camps, you know, the barracks like thing, you know, I so many people in the, in the barracks. So we, we were liberated in 1945, the 10th of May. 10th of May? 1945, about a couple of days after, before Hitler died. Before Hitler died. Did you, ever, did you ever have any close calls? Did you, were you ever in, what kind of danger would you say you were in during that time? Oh, it was, it was, every day was dangerous. There wasn't a day that wasn't, uh, you know, I consider you sometimes you said, uh, so how the hell they going to get out of here? And then we had, we heard some of the, you know, different things from the atrocities that the Germans was uh, committing in the camps. Like, before they leave, they kill everybody. Right. See, so they have to run away. But we were up, we were up close to the place in Austria where we were. It was close to uh, the, the just look back in the water. Uh -huh. You can hear the, the Russian cannonading. You can hear the concussion from the, 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 the artillery, you know? Oh, yeah. So, can you hear me? Can everybody hear me? Yes, yes. we can hear you. Okay, all right. So, um, later in, um, during this interview, I asked my father how he survived. And he never really answered that question. But um, I, I know that one reason why he survived was because he was not assigned to work in the quarry. He was assigned to work as a lumberjack. So he spent every day um, out in the forest around the camp uh, cutting down trees. Um, another reason why he survived was because he had enormous physical and mental strength. Um, but one of the main reasons, possibly the main reason why he survived was because of his language skills. Um, prisoners with language skills were usually allowed to survive longer than other prisoners because they were used as interpreters. 
So my father's nickname in the camp became the translator. Now, of course, he had English as a, a native language. He had Dutch because he was from St. Martin. And as a child, he had gone to Dutch medium schools. Uh, he was able to learn German because Dutch is very close to German. And um, maybe um, two, two or three years before um, he was deported from Italy, the German army took control of the camps in, in Italy. So um, he was able to pick up a lot of German um, from hearing the, the German soldiers um, who were in charge of those camps. Um, Papiamento is a Spanish and Portuguese based Creole spoken in, in the Southern Caribbean on Aruba and Curaçao where he lived uh, for several years and um, it has Latin roots. So when he lived in Venezuela, he was able to learn Spanish quite easily. Um, and knowing Spanish, he was able to learn Italian quite easily. And he spent a long time in Italy, four years. Um, and there were lots of prisoners in Mauthausen who spoke all of these European languages. So um, he was able to communicate with a lot of people. Um, and that's how he gained the, the nickname of translator. Um, my father's experience uh, was an example of an untold story that only came to light because of oral history. Um, and this is a picture of him, the same picture of him, um, as you can see immediately after the war. Um, but I don't know where this picture was taken and I never got him to tell me about it. Um, oh, sorry. Um, in closing, I'd just like to say that my father's oral history um, is the basis of this book that I wrote about his World War II experiences and, and my visits to Mauthausen. So I hope that my experience um, with oral history will encourage you and your students and, and other people to embark on oral history projects with your families and, and members of your communities. So thank you very much. No, thank you, Mary. If everyone on the call who's willing to participate could give Mary a waterfall, which is where everyone types some kind words and thank yous in the chat. So Mary, I hope you can see your waterfall of appreciation. Oh, I'll look for that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's happening. Thank you, everyone. It's in the chat. I agree. Amazing, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So I believe we will be transitioning to our next speaker. So Mary, if you can stop uh, my share. Yes, please stop sharing. Mm -hmm. And as we transition to the next speaker, you have just a moment or two if you want to jot down any questions for Mary and send those to Juliet or myself will work on fielding those out. Okay, so our next speaker is Harry Kucha Kucha. He's a lecturer in language education at the University of Leeds, England, where he also leads the MATSAL Young Learners Program. He's been involved in a range of teacher education and materials development initiatives in Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, and Europe. More recently, he has served as a consultant in Albania, South Sudan, Afghanistan, Cote d'Ivoire, Guinea, Senegal, Brazil, Colombia, and Mexico. Harry was recognized as one of TESOL International Association's 30 upcoming leaders in ELT globally in 2016. His research interests include teaching English to young learners, English medium education, language teacher education, and context appropriate pedagogies, and he has published in these areas. He is currently president of IATEFO. Let's welcome Harry today. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ayana, and I would like to thank uh, Juliet as well for coordinating all of this. It, it's a bit nerve wracking for me when, when I was approached by Ayana to to be part of this, I was initially very excited. And then uh, she announced the lineup and I felt, oh, sorry, I'll be dwarfed. 
So I took the wise decision of telling a personal story because I come from a, a storytelling culture. And so when um, I don't feel very safe or very confident, I resort to the folk tales and my own stories. And like Mary said, that's a way of capturing the, the soul of the African uh, personality and the individual. So I'd like to talk about my own personal story and to reflect on this. And I do not claim that this is representative of any uh, other African's reality, but it does give an indication of the landscape uh, that I have as a, a black African uh, navigated in the world of ELT. I often hear people say with excitement when they introduce me uh, that I'm uh, uh, IHFO's first black president. And I listen to that with a bit of sadness uh, because it tells something of our organizations that in 55 years, um, there has been only one black African president in the two largest ELT organizations in the world say something about uh, the ELT world in which we, we work and say something about what we need to do. So I just want to start by introducing my country. It's called Cameroon. And in this country in West Africa, there is a huge linguistic diversity. In fact, uh, in 2014, the total population was estimated by the World Bank was at 22.77 million. And this represents approximately 2% of the African population, the total African population. So with 2% of Africa's population, Cameroon's linguistic diversity is, uh, linguistic density is indeed 13.5% of Africa's languages. So it's a, an immensely multilingual uh, context. Um, but this linguistic and cultural diversity, the many tribes, the many languages, are not part of the mainstream discourse of education itself. So I grew up in this context where my local language, Agam, was deposited at home and then when I went to school, another language, which was very foreign to me, was the language of instruction. And in many cases, that language shut the door to the home in the sense that parents, especially children in uh, parents of children in rural communities, which are the largest communities in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, do not then have full access to education because they cannot be supported by their parents at home. So that's the context in which I grew up in a country that really wants to maintain a kind of a unity from its historic pieces of an Anglophone or an Anglophonized and a Francophonized ethnic uh, identity. And so it does suppress local languages at the expense, well, it does promote French and English at the expense of these uh, local languages. So there is this education and language disconnect that's already been uh, uh, dealt with in the literature. I won't get down, uh, I, won't, I, won't, I won't talk about that for long, for long, but it does pose a problem of epistemic injustices because uh, people are made to feel that because they do not speak good English or good French, they are not educated. And that is the kind of culture of education in which I grew up, struggling to learn a language, sometimes at the expense of learning content that would have been conveyed in an easier way with the language that I'm familiar with. However, the problem we have in this country is that, and I guess in many multilingual uh, Sub-Saharan African countries, is that far from being divided because of our many languages, we are actually divided because of these two neutral languages. And if you list following the, uh, the news from Cameroon, it's a country that's been, that's now gone through four years of armed conflict because of these new ethnic identities 
along foreign languages. Now, when you add that, and I was listening to President Biden yesterday talk about the scaring effect that comes with prolonged economic pain. When you look at this post-colonial reality that's still divisive, and you add up that up with hundreds of years of slavery, and you, 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 you see how the pandemic of racial discrimination, how long it's existed. And if you see the impact of COVID within a year and what it's cost human lives, you can, not just human life, but uh, the way people think human society as a whole, economic and, 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 economic and, and all sorts of uh, human endeavor, then you can imagine what hundreds of years of that kind of, of, a, of a stronger, maybe, uh, uh, racial pandemic would cost an ordinary African. Now I'm make, painting this graphic picture because I want to, to get to a point which I would raise in a couple of minutes. Just permit me now talk about three key uh, incidents that have happened to me. I grew up in this country. I was lucky to, to work as a teacher when I was 26. I became a teacher trainer in my country. And I rose very quickly after seven years to being uh, a national pedagogic inspector in the Ministry of Education. And I was in charge of English and French. So as a policy, as a national inspector, I am supposed to be a policymaker, to be involved in the key decisions about language education. But very often um, I have been asked to shut up when an external expert was talking about language education in my country. So with seven, eight years of experience of teaching in the most remote parts of my country, an education that qualified me as a teacher, an experience that qualified me as a policymaker, all of that didn't count when a native speaker teacher with a CELTA and DELTA was talking to my minister about English language education in Cameroon. That was the first time I came face to face with injustice in the ELT field. And at that point, I, I, I took a decision to investigate, to research ELT to a point where I could make myself an expert to be able to counteract those discourses that were pervasive in my own context. Now, I was very lucky at that time to uh, have had a scholarship to study in the UK and then went back to my job and then came back to do a, a PhD. And I feel very honored now to be able to advise uh, uh, international organizations working in the area of ELT. But that initial injustice, that initial uh, uh, encounter with a native speaker, uh, which put me as a second class person in, 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 in talking about pedagogy and language education in my context has had a long lasting effect, uh, which I might talk about in, if, we, if that's raised again. A second incident which I have faced more recently is uh, working with Africa Elta, previously Africa TISOL, uh, I've been particularly interested in the notion of decolonizing language education in Africa. And uh, one of the initiatives I've been involved in is the uh, decentering ELT scheme. And we did run four very important webinars uh, through the Africa TISOL platform uh, sometimes last year. Now, this took a lot of time planning and I worked with an international organization that had uh, funded projects, looking through all the different ELT projects to kind of identify patterns, identify those projects that could promote the notion of decentering ELT. And I found these projects and these speakers as the best possible people to help uh, promote the notion of decentering and decolonizing ELT in, 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 in Africa through our webinar series. Now, I had responses on social media were immediate. There was a gender war 
against the organizer of this event. And I think Africa, I remember Africa Elta received email messages on Facebook uh, through their, their different platforms. I, and I did receive so many messages. And the key message was, this is not gender representative. Now I get the point in fighting against gender bias. And I think it is very important. But the problem with social injustices is that they are all dangerous tools or dangerous weapons which have the same handle. Ignorance of the other's reality, a false sense of superiority, and a phobia for being irrelevant. Now, the, 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 the number of female colleagues who put so much pressure on me criticizing the gender imbalance did not approach the organization that had funded male dominant projects from which we, we, we had our pool of speakers. And in fact, I did speak with one of the critics who dreaded speaking to this uh, to the organization because she was intimidated by the men. They were all white men, and she was intimidated by them. Yet Africa Elta and Harry Kucha were the target of their protest. Now that made me think very carefully about what standards. We, we put in front for social justice. And the second issue that I had engaging with some of these people were that some of them were experts in Africa, doing a lot of work in Africa. Yet it was impossible through them to find teachers that they had empowered in the African context to be able to challenge what they thought were stereotypes. So I found this as a double standard of people working within Africa as experts, yet unable to identify people that they can nurture, support to become experts in the field. I thought that in fighting this, this in, in fighting uh, the gender, in going down the gender route, what was actually happening was uh, to dismantle an initiative that had as part of its in, uh, intention to promote our female colleagues as well. Now, this third incident that I've had working as an academic in the UK has been kind of institutional injustice, institutional inequalities. So for example, working in an institution that claims to attract the best talent from around the world, but being reminded all the time that I have to produce at the same level as my colleague in the next office who is supported. So a very practical example, uh, in 2000 and a couple of years back, I had to transition in the UK. When you come, you, you work as a tier two uh, migrant. And then after a number of years, you then can apply for permanent residence. And to do that, you, you spend a lot of money. So I was going to spend in the neighborhood of 3,000 pounds after having spent 4,000 pounds over a period on tier two. Now my colleague next door, who was European, was going to do the same and that would cost her uh, 100 pounds. And the university was paying for, for that, yet, I was having to spend 3,000 pounds to raise 3,000 pounds to pay for the same thing and the university wasn't supporting. But the university still expected me to perform at the same level. Now I did change universities. I did, I did resign from that university, but it told me something about what equal opportunity really means, what we actually call equality. And that happens within the field of ELT. Okay, the, the, the ethics of professional ELT projects, we know for a long time, and Adrian Holiday talked about this so many years ago, and it's been echoed again by people like Howell Coleman, is that very many 
so-called EOT developmental projects are often very time bound. They are led by expatriate people who are not connected with the community in which they are meant to carry that study. They are very agenda based and often based on a deficit paradigm because teachers are not doing the right thing. We are proposing a new approach. We are bringing the money and we are paying our people to come and help your teachers to do what we think they should be doing. But we know now that all democratic uh, pedagogies, democratic pedagogies don't work in every culture because they need to be consistent with democratic cultures and some African traditional cultures are not democratic in the sense in which the West views democracy. And so simply transferring these pedagogies doesn't always work. Now, these projects often have asymmetrical relationships. Very often colleagues, Western colleagues tell me, oh, the teachers are very happy with what we are doing. And then when I approach the teachers, they say, no, sorry, we are not learning anything from what's happening. So this kind of uh, uh, asymmetric relationship that puts the African professional at the receiving end, at the inferior end, influences lots of things within the field itself. And no doubt, most ELT projects have actually be ended up being rejected in the communities in which they are, they are, they are implemented. They survive during the, the period of the funding, and then they, they, they tend to disappear once the funding is gone. Now, I want to bring this back, and I'm getting to the end of my job, to something that's more about us as organizations. And I'm looking at the demographics of the world now. The population of the world, this is from a, a world of matters. I don't know how accurate it is, but this is 2020. Now, Africa is the second largest population in the world. And Africa is the only continent in the world where children go to school in a language that's not the home language. So in other words, English language education and French and maybe Portuguese are the languages of education. So in terms of population learning English language and teaching English language, we can say Africa has the second largest population in the world. But when I've, I've looked at the two main uh, uh, ELT organizations, ITFL and TISOL, and I've gone back to history to look at how many presidents from Africa these associations have had over the last 55 years. Your guess is as good as mine. How many Africans, Black Africans, have been in the TISOL board of directors over the last 54 years? How many plenary speakers, how many Black African plenary speakers have we had in TISOL, in ITFL over the last 55 years? Now, at most, the answer to any of these questions will be one. Now, that is not consistent with the demographics of ELT teaching and learning. And so I think that there is something inherently wrong with the way uh, we are operating as global organizations and our notions of justice and equity, uh, of equality. So maybe we need to be thinking about transitioning from equality to equity because the world of ELT is never and has never been a level playing ground. We know that the discourses of native versus non-native speakers, the power of the native speaker over the non-native speaker, those discourses are still there. And we, 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 we end at the level of rhetoric with no real concrete action. It's that discourse that made me a second class citizen or policy maker in my country in the face of someone who knew nothing about the context in which I work. So maybe we need to be providing that kind of support that enables our ELT world to be a fairer world where we can genuinely learn about things that are happening in the field in those areas of the world we don't know. And if we only find the best of the best from these parts of the world, 
to put on our major platforms, then we might not always find them, not because they don't exist, but because we are looking just across the other side of, 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 of the fence and not looking far enough. So for me, within the field of ELT, there are a number of steps we can take as global organizations to fight racism by being allies of the fight itself and not just being commentators. We need as organizations to acknowledge that there is injustice within our field, within the people who populate our field. And we need to very explicitly invest in researching these issues. We need to give Africans and all minority staff and leadership a space to be honest, to be angry about the things. Very often I've been asked to explain what was racist about something someone did. And I'm, I always say racism is not in the intention, is not so much in the intention as it is in the outcome. So if you stretch out your hand and maybe your finger best my eye, you're not going to say you didn't hurt me because you didn't intend to hurt me. No, you did. So we need to unpack those aspects of social injustice. And I, I say it again, I'm talking about racism from a black African perspective, but this is equally valid for all other forms of injustices. We need to affirm this by naming those issues explicitly and publicly and, and naming our commitments explicitly and publicly. We need to act and action requires our collective effort. These are ideas that I put together, but also with help from Dr. Muna Abdi, whose, whose uh, tweet was very important in helping me look at uh, anti-racism good practices for organizations like TISO and IHFL. Uh, I hope that I have used my short time to, to, to raise some key issues in relation to the governance of our two organizations and that we can reflect on action going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Harry. And um, I don't know if you had a chance to watch the chat, probably not, but this is this is wonderful. If everybody can prepare to give some comments and show some love and do a waterfall for Harry. Oh, thank you. Oh, look at that. Thank you so much. Thank this you. Is wonderful. Look at that. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So as we prepare for our, our last and final speaker, and thank you for those who have sent questions. I have them. We have uh, one or two questions at the end for Mary, Mary and Harry already. So this is wonderful. Are we preparing to, sh uh, to share a screen? I don't, I don't have a screen to share later on. Oh, okay, okay, great, great. All right, well, I'm gonna go move forward with introductions. So our, our last and final speaker uh, today is Awad, Dr. Awad Ibrahim. He is a, an award-winning author and a professor at the Faculty of Education, University of Ottawa, Canada. He is a curriculum theorist with special interest in applied linguistics, hip hop, youth and black popular culture, cultural studies, sociology of education, social justice, community service learning, and diasporic and continental African identities. He has taught in the US and Ohio and has a number of projects internationally, including Morocco, Sudan, United Arab Emirates, and the United States. He has more than 100 publications, including 13 books. Let's welcome Dr. Awad Ibrahim today. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ayana. Thank you, TESOL International. Uh, thank you, particularly those of you who have organized conferences, you know how much time it takes. So Juliet, hats off uh, to you, my girl. Uh, you, have, uh, you have done a fantastic, fantastic job. And of course, nothing could happen unless Ayana is leading it. So I'm uh, my girl, I'm, uh, 
I'm showing a lot of love, right? So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm uh, and and I'm, I'm, I'm particularly honored uh, to be among such a high esteemed colleague, uh, Mary. Thank you, thank you so much. Appreciate that, Harry. Uh, my brother is, uh, is just been, uh, is just been a blessing to share the, the floor with you. So I'm, I'm, I'm really, really delighted. And I'm seeing that we have about 114 people. Uh, who actually need to get a life. It's Saturday afternoon, so uh, Saturday morning. Uh, so you, I, I don't know what you're doing on Saturday morning. So I, uh, and in my case, it's, uh, it's uh, close to 8 p.m. In, uh, in the evening. So um, it only shows uh, your commitment, uh, your energy, and your um, clearly that you, you, you are showing a lot of love. Um, so I'm, I'm particularly honored to be part of such high uh, esteemed colleague uh, or colleagues. I, um, I wish I could be like Mary and I wish I could be like Harry, um, who are, you could tell that they're just a fantastic storytellers. Um, I had planned uh, to tell you two stories, um, but I'm not going to uh, because I think it's high time for us to ask really, really essential questions. How do we go on living after witnessing trauma? I'm gonna pause and I'm gonna reiterate my question again. How do we go on teaching after witnessing trauma? We had just witnessed uh, Harry, we had just witnessed Mary and they, they have beautiful stories to tell, but they're painful stories to tell. So how do we deal with that as ELT? Um, how do we go on uh, witnessing, uh, how do we go on teaching after witnessing a nine year old girl who's pepper sprayed? How, how do we move on? How do we teach after witnessing death? I'm pausing because these are essential questions that we, particularly in TESOL, particularly in ELT, we need to pause, we need to think about them. How do we teach in a time of pandemic where black and brown bodies are disproportionately affected? What is the role of TESOL, particularly? What is the role of applied linguistics generally? What do we teach and how do we teach um, after witnessing this video? I have to warn you, you can shut off your mic, you can shut off your computer if you want to. For those of you who had witnessed trauma, please be warned because this is, this is really painful. I had planned and I had a Prezi and I was gonna go with the plan and the Prezi until I watched this video. This is my daughter and I could just see her going through the same thing that we're gonna watch in the video. I'm gonna share my screen now. So I, I plan to talk to you about a chapter that I, I uh, just published and it's called The New Normal, English Language Learning, Pop Culture and Politics of Investment. So you can refer to it, you can go back to, it's published in a book edited by Werner and, and Cheggy and the title is Pop Culture in Language Education pop culture and language education, theory, research, and practice. I'm not gonna talk about that anymore because again, how do we go on teaching after witnessing something like this? Um, so I decided not to deal with the chapter. We decided not to deal with my Prezi, which I had already planned. And instead I wanted to flip and talk about what I call the pedagogy of the heart. 
And I'm going to propose this as a central framework for us to think about as ELT teachers. I'm going to propose also, after witnessing something like this, you can't go on without showing radical love. So I'm going to propose that as a framework that might uh, help us to uh, think about what we do. So uh, instead of going through my Prezi, I was like, hell with TESOL, hell with um, my Prezi, let's talk about this. Um, and, and I'm gonna uh, pose more questions. At the end, I may, if I have time, talk to you very briefly about uh, the work that I have done. But an essential question that we all uh, need, uh, need to think about is, how do we talk about this? How do we talk about what, what we had just witnessed? And how do we even begin, for God's sake, to teach about this? How do we teach it? How do we, how do we even begin? Where do we begin to teach it? Um, so um, instead of uh, talk about pedagogical issues that, that Mary just offered, fantastically. Harry just offered us a, a, a brilliant conceptualization of decolonization. I'm gonna propose for us, this is not about what our classrooms should look like or what we were gonna do in our classrooms. This is about us teachers. Let's think about us because the best gift that you can give to your students is yourself. The best gift that you can give to your students is that radical love, is yourself. Um, so let's pause as teachers and think about the trauma that we go through and how that affects us, how that affects our, our students. I'm gonna, I'm gonna offer about three reasons for why, for God's sake, a nine-year-old girl would be pepper spray would be handcuffed uh, and, we'd be, and, and, and we'll be dealt with this, the way that we just saw. While uh, a, 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 a mob, uh, for God's sake, a mob will go into the, the parliament, the US parliament, the Congress, the Senate, and they walk out of it as if, as if nothing happened. Did, uh, can you hear me? Okay. Because I, oh, for, for a second, I kind of lost it. Um, um, it and, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, actually ask, make us think about why something like this would happen to begin with. Why would George Floyd be killed? Um, and it's all about blackness. It's about the skin we in, the skin we embody, uh, these bodies that speak so loudly, um, that speak without us saying a word. As soon as my body is seen, as soon as my body enters the room, it speaks, it speaks so loudly. This is why we need to reconfigure the very idea of language itself to include uh, the body as a form of language. Um, so I'm going to propose that one of the reasons why this nine-year-old, why George Floyd, why uh, Brianna Taylor and, and, and so many others would be killed so readily is not only because of the skin, but because of the narrative of the, of, of, and the representation of that body. Um, so blackness, uh, both in the US, uh, I would say in North America and globally, uh, it's becoming a narrative. It's a story that we tell, but it's a story increasingly, particularly I'm thinking about North America, I'm thinking as Canadian, I'm, I'm thinking about the US. Uh, it's a story of the monster. That's a key, key concept that I'm proposing for us as teachers to think about. Uh, blackness is the story, is the narrative of the monster. 
um, we have created a monster. That's why a nine year old girl would be already read, already be seen, um, reconfigured, re, uh, 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 kind of looked at, uh, treated as a monster. She's a menace. Um, so uh, not only is, is it a monster, but it's a menacing monster to be, to, to, that's the second reason why uh, George Floyd would be killed. Why a nine-year-old girl would be pepper sprayed and handcuffed? Um, because um, once you create a monster, once you create um, a narrative uh, around the body and this body in particular, then it's very easy for you to treat it as such. Um, but I'm going to propose also something else. You had witnessed, and I hope you uh, had seen the video with George Floyd and also with the girl here. The second reason, what I call the ethics of the face, F-A-C-E. The ethics of the face, and that is, uh, and this is um, uh, Emmanuel, Emmanuel Levinas, uh, he's a Holocaust survivor, and he said the Holocaust happened, and Mary had just talked to us about it. Um, the Holocaust happened precisely because the Nazis did not see the faces of the people they killed. Because if you look at someone's face, if you look at a nine-year-old girl and, and treating her as uh, a nine-year-old girl, I think someone had a mic on. You can't, you can't, you can't pepper spray her. You cannot, you cannot do that. You can do that precisely because you're not looking her in the face. You're not seeing the pain in her face. You're not seeing the pain in George Floyd's face. So once you erase faces, once you erase and not look at people, then you are creating not only a narrative of the monster, but you can very easily uh, create the, the, uh, the, um, a, a faceless, in other words, removing uh, their humanity to it. They become an object. They become something that you deal with, just like a policeman going into a, a place and they don't know, they, 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 they don't even care who are the people in front of them. And so Martin Buber talks about there are two ways for us as teachers to look at the students that we're dealing with. We can either deal with them as I, thou, or I, it, I, the teacher, and your students. You have one of two options, especially if you're thinking about it in terms of ethics. You can either deal with them as a, as a thou, in other words, a human being, or you can deal with them as another, another uh, pipeline that you need to graduate and let go. Uh, so you deal with them as it. So you're moving them from humanity to an object. Um, and that's what is happening with this girl, and what is happening with uh, George Floyd. Not only that, and this is the third reason why um, uh, George Floyd was killed and this uh, nine-year-old girl was, uh, was pepper sprayed, is that we're moving a blackness from a noun to a verb. It's something that we do, something we do. So I, I, I'm, I'm uh, somehow my blackness right now, as, as I speak, is uh, uh, speaking louder than uh, anything that I can say. So in this sense, then we need to think as teachers, we need to think about what is the narrative that we're creating, one, two, uh, what, whether that narrative is a monster narrative or a, a humanity narrative. Three, uh, the ethics uh, through which we are relating to our students, uh, whether it's an I, thou, or an I, it. Uh, um, 
and and how do we how are we conceptualizing the very idea of the black body that we that we have in front of us so very very quickly i know i'm i'm i'm, I'm, uh, I'm uh, we are, we we are already late with time um but but really quickly what is all this has to do with us as teachers it has to do everything with us as teachers so i uh, did three studies about black immigrants in north america in particular the first thing that they have to encounter is the narrative of blackness so uh, where they come from they have other adjectives such as harry just talked to us as being Cameroonais, um, or being Senegalese, or being South Sudanese, or being uh, Kenyan, and so on and so forth. And you, you are from uh, uh, Kukulu, or or, or uh, Nubian, or uh, um, uh, different tribes and different languages. All of these adjectives are subsumed under an, um, the umbrella of blackness once they arrive to North America. So the first thing that they have to encounter is this narrative. And this is why I'm coming back to this narrative. Uh, so that we as teachers need to be very mindful of whether we are uh, replaying the narrative of the master or not in our classrooms. So the students, the particularly black um, immigrants, both from the Caribbean as well as from the continent the first thing they, they encounter is this narrative that I just told you about. So to become American, uh, I concluded. To become Canadian, particularly, I'm talking about North America, that, that's where my research was conducted, uh, is to become Black. Is to become familiar with this narrative. It's to be mindful of the stories. Is to be mindful of what is the body that we, that, 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 that we carry uh, with us. Um, and but something else, and this is the the story of the the uh, the chapter that I I, I told you about. Um, I, I told in this in in the chapter I told the story of two uh, two participants, one from South Africa and one from Sudan, um, both of whom actually, um, and I encountered them in a very interesting way. Uh, like uh, what was really interesting about them, if you hear them you would not recognize that they, um, are, they are not uh, American in particular. Their accent, the way they talk, and I, this, is the, this is the story that I told in, in the chapter. Um, so it was really interesting for me, I conducted a small interview with them and I said, how come, how, how come you sound so American? And, they, and the bottom line is, are you, are you ready for this? Music, black music, that's the reason. Black films, black TV shows, everything black, okay? That's the, uh, the and then I introduced, I reintroduced the idea of um, Norton, uh, Nor Nor uh, Bonnie Norton uh, idea of investment. But I juxtaposed it with uh, Bakhtin's idea of uh, population. So we populate what we love, we populate, we invest into what we desire, we invest into that which with which we are identified. So um, this creates uh, uh, not only uh, uh, black culture and black English in so in, in a distinct ways, um, becoming sites of identity investment and language and linguistic investment as well. And that's the ultimate conclusion that I, I reach in the chapter. I hope I walked you through the story that we, we need to tell as teachers and, and be mindful. Um, so link that to the, um, the, uh, the, the, two, the two stories of research that I told you about. One in this chapter that's coming from the continent and another one coming from North America. So with that in mind, I, uh, I, I hope I did not uh, did over time. Uh, I'm gonna stop it there. Thank you. Thank you so much.
This is wonderful. And just like we've been doing all day, let's give Awad his waterfall. Let's light the chat up. No, yes. this is not lighting. This is burning the house. Yes, yes. Indeed. Burning the house. Thanks, folks. Appreciate it. That's what I call that's what I call radical love, right? We have you you all for just a few minutes. And I think what I'm going to do, if you don't mind, if the panel members don't mind, I'd like to pose the same question to you because the questions we got were very similar. So, so this is you know indeed on the minds of, of participants. So I'm going to ask each of you, and I think you've already done this for sure in your presentations, but this will be your chance to just maybe give us um, another piece of, of a takeaway. And so some researchers have um, you know, wrote about and researched how nice T-Sol is. T-Sol is a nice field, <laughs> right? And so if T-Sol is so nice, right? What advice do you have? Um, you know, does niceness apply to our field, right? And then what advice would you give uh, to the organization and educators and supporters to think about um, decolonizing TESOL, right? And so maybe just if each one of you could, could give us uh, maybe one or two quick ideas on that. And thank you for people who sent the questions in and allowing me to weave them together just a bit for the sake of time. You know, can we start? Can we let, me, let me just throw out an idea really, really quickly, but because I know Harry, uh, you gave this a lot more thinking, and, and so did Mary, uh, given your lengthy experience with uh, with the field. Uh, we cannot talk about what we do not know. In other words, uh, if we begin with that premise, we need to take our ignorance seriously. Um, if if that's that's ultimately the, the, the most practical thing that that, that I can offer uh, not only uh, the field but uh, but uh, overall as uh, us as teachers uh, we can't think about just our students um, as I began this presentation by arguing that the best thing that we can do is uh, the best gift that we can give our students is ourselves. If we're not centered, if, we, if, if we're not mindful, and if we're not taking our ignorance seriously, then there is a perpetuation of uh, what Harry just presented. Yeah. Leave it there. Thank you, Why? Thank you. Just to add, and I'm, I'm, I think I am particularly privileged to have been in a, in a leadership position in uh, an international organization. Mm -hmm. And, but also in, in a, 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 apart from now, this is the, actually the first time I've worked for four universities in the UK. And this is the first time I am not the only black staff. Elsewhere, I've been the only black member of staff in the Department of Education. And, and, and the, I think one of the things we do, we are very good at in the TESOL profession is that we use language to appear to be what we are not. And we need to start using language exactly how we need to use it. So nice, maybe not quite. It's something else. It's not being nice. We are just trying to be very clever with the way we position things. And having been the kind of person, I'm very used to being the window curtain. And that's, that's a, a phrase I use a lot within, um, within uh, IHFL. So, oh, look at us. We've got this black person in our member of staff, that's equality. It's not, I do not represent Africa. I have lived in the UK for 10 years now. So despite the work I do in Africa, I, my, my vision of Africa is already tinted by a new experience. Now that's not necessarily negative, it could be a very positive force, but there are indigenous African professionals who are doing far more work than I am doing, but who are not recognized because they don't have the, 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 the they are not lucky to have been positioned a, to find themselves in a country like the UK or the US to then be projected to the rest of the world as models of how well 
uh, these this, uh, uh, countries are doing with diversity. So we need to be, in addition to what, um, uh, what my brother just said, apart from not talking about what we don't know, I think we need to think about very carefully about what happens to people when they are in a position of weakness and how easy it is for injustices of today to roll out to years ahead. Because I think people very want us to quickly forget the past. Sorry, the past can't be forgotten when its impact is still very much in the present. And we need to recognize that all the time, that if, because we have not committed racism, doesn't mean that we are entirely free of racism. We are coming from a history where there have been injustices uh, uh, which, have, which we have either, our, our, our parents, our ancestors down the line have either benefited from or suffered from. And that has a multiplier effect from generation to generation. And so we need to be approaching people. For example, for example, I was in Nigeria at the ITFO, uh, Africa to Solve conference. And I said something in the room. I asked teachers, the male teachers, I said, can you raise your hand or stand up? If when we were all teenagers in secondary school, you laughed at a girl because she had her menses in class and wet her dress. And behold, there were many male teachers standing up. Now, Imagine how many school girls dropped out of school because they were so ashamed of themselves that as something natural, they probably their parents didn't educate them about happened to them in the classroom and the boys all shouted and gave her nicknames. I know of many classmates who left school forever then. So somehow I am responsible for what has become of them. And my children will uh, have benefited from me being in a position of power where her children have not benefited because thanks to my bullying and ignorance as a teenager, she left school. So somehow we need to be thinking that we are partly responsible for, or at least we are beneficiaries of what, of the injustices. And, and that needs to happen, especially in the ELT field, because it's one of those areas we don't talk about, but that's an area that is plagued with injustice historically and in the present. Thank you. Thank you, Harry and Awad. And, and Mary, do you have um, some a closing point for us? Yeah, um, I, there's so many. I, <laughs> this is really um, just amazing. I just want to thank Harry and Awad for these just amazing presentations. But um, one thing that um, was just said about forgetting the past, you know, um, I, I alluded to that at the end of my, my presentation. I, I think, Harry, you were talking about um, how, you know, th there's um, a lot of willingness to forget the past, if, if I understood what you were saying. And, and that is exactly what, that's exactly why in the United States, we, we cannot move forward because um, a lot of people, um, especially in over the last five or six years, there's been a huge movement. I mean, I think that in the United States, it, it has become clear and perhaps in the whole world, what happens when you, you try to forget the past, you try to erase it. And you, because it causes you to, to um, repeat the mistakes of the past. You know, the, the saying, and I put this at the end of my presentation, is that those who forget history are condemned to repeat it. So um, <laughs> we, you know, we, we, we can't climb out of a lot of the problems that we're in in the United States because we don't want to recognize that, that what happened yesterday, that what happens today is re the result of what happened yesterday. Um, and what you said, Ayana, about being nice and uh, what Harry said about vocabulary um, and, and hiding behind vocabulary, I think is really very important because, you know, there's nice and there's good. And I think that TESOL is a very nice profession, but is it doing all the good that it can? That's the question. 
you know, it's like the T-Cell Association is very diverse and that's nice, <laughs> but is it inclusive? That would be good, okay? So there's nice versus good. So there's always, you know, um, we, we, we are very, we're, we're language professionals, right? So we're really excellent at using language in, in many of the ways that Harry was talking about. Um, but, <laughs> you know, and as Harry said, we, we have to, to take our ignorance seriously. No, Awad, did you say that? Taking our ignorance seriously? I think you're the one that said that, Awad. Doesn't, well, what, one of you said that, and I, I, I really, um, that resonated with me. Because I, I, I've um, always believed very strongly that a truly wise person, uh, or in this case, a truly wise organization, knows what it doesn't know. And somehow, maybe it's difficult for academics to admit that they don't know something, or um, I don't know, maybe because we're teachers and we, you know, we have this sort of um, position uh, in, in the classroom, maybe we extend that further than we should, because in the classroom, we are all knowing or we're, you know, whatever we are, but, um, <laughs> you know, we, we, we have to understand what we don't know and we have to understand how what we don't know might be affecting um, our students. So it, it's, it would be the easiest thing in the world for us to hide behind the, um, I would say rather cowardly notion that what happens outside of the classroom and what's happening, you know, uh, to George Floyd and some nine-year-old girl who was pepper sprayed doesn't have anything to do with us. But um, th that is a very cowardly notion because we, we live in the world and these things are happening in the world. Uh, and we don't know the extent to which they might be, ex uh, they might be affecting our students. So again, you know, it's a question of, of um, taking our ignorance seriously and, and uh, understanding what we don't know. And um, I don't think that there's been a, a very um, good track record in um, not only in TESOL, but um, in perhaps in education in general um, of understanding what we don't know. Um, so I, I, um, everything that the two of you have said, not only during your presentations, but afterwards in this uh, question and answer period, has really resonated with me. And I, I, I want to thank you for your courage. I think it takes a lot of courage, not only to be in the positions that both of you are in, but also to speak with such, um, such honesty about, um, about how, how these, uh, all these issues affect you and, and, and all of the rest of us. So I thank you, both of you. Awad and Harry for your, your courage. And TESOL, again, for giving us the, the space to, to uh, talk about this. Yes, thank you, Mary. Thank you. And I just, you know, when we say TESOL, it's, it's all of us. We're all here, and even those who will be listening to the recording. So thank you all for your time and attention. I just want to, um, I'm going to have Deborah Short give us some closing words. I have some music to play, closing music, but if I could just have TESOL staff members, board members, current and past, just please wave. I see some past presidents and past board members on there. I just wanted to say thank hello you. and thank you for joining us today. Okay. Ayana, we have two new incoming board members too, so they might, um, oh. Joyce oh. and Grace might wave their hands as well. Yes, please do. Thank Congratulations. You. Thank you. Congratulations to you, Joyce. Well, I just want to thank everyone for spending this hour and a half. It flew by for me, and what extraordinary and heartbreaking stories we heard today. It really shows the power of storytelling, the power of being an eyewitness and having the human face. There are so many themes that we heard. Um, we heard about linguistic injustice, social injustice. We heard about um, you know, the narrative of the monster. These are important things that we have to keep close to our hearts so that we can find out more about what we don't know as we were just talking about. We've also heard about how being multilingual and multicultural makes somebody nimble and flexible and gives a powerful skill for survival. Okay. I think what we're, we've all said, what we've seen in the chat is that we have to be more intentional in listening to our colleagues and our students. 
hearing their stories, bringing their knowledge and experience into our classrooms. We need collective efforts to acknowledge, affirm, and act, as Harry said, to share their stories, to be allies, not commentators, to employ the pedagogy of the heart and find out what we don't know. I just want to share a couple of quotes I, I briefly saw stroll by in the chat, but Lavette said we have to promote equity over equality. And Daria said we have so many stories around us if we know how to look at them. Mm -hmm. Thomas pointed out that he loved the model of how oral history personalizes, humanizes, and makes real history, and that there's a great potential for teaching when we bring in oral history to the classroom. And Hind reminded us that we can create change by teaching our students about racial injustice and guiding them to stand up for their rights. And that's what we do as educators. We learn and we engage with our students. We empower our students and our colleagues. And I'm so grateful to Mary, Harry, Awad, and you, Ayana, for bringing us all together today. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you and I much. have a new song. It's new to me that I've been listening to a lot. So on your way out, uh, before you log off, uh, enjoy the acapella sound of a South African uh, group. I, I believe the song is The Joy. Yes, I'll post it. I'll pull it up and post it. But thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Respect. Thank you. Bye-bye.